And so that's what we want. We want to change the generations that are coming behind us. We want to change the cycle. And that's what I think we have to do. We have to break the cycle that we're in and we start making the next generation better than the generation we're in. Now we missed you. The yep. show was still, you know, we had to do what we had to do. We had our celebration of life and, and appreciated you in my terms, not you guys' terms. So we're happy that you're here. I had faith that you would be back. I'm back. Glad to be back. So where were you last week? I had a leadership review training. So. Well, man, what? Went good. Well, what, what is it about? <laughs> I mean, that's. <laughs> leadership for what? what? Yeah, <laughs> I know. <laughs> leadership to overtake the country. Leadership to destroy <laughs> America. Leadership to you know, we did some empower training at America. We did some training at our church for the leadership at our church and uh, spoke to some guys who walked us through on how to communicate effectively with with different types of people, meaning like different backgrounds and different uh, skill sets and different ages and generation gaps and things like that, and how to how to work and navigate those things together to be an effective leadership team at the church. So we worked through all those things and, and talked and that sounds so much more important than what we were doing. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> but my, my biggest question is, but when you were talking about the leadership, leadership as in what, what, are, what are the goals? I mean, there's you're trying to reach an end point with leadership, it, and it's with church, so I'm assuming it's— So heaven would be the goal. Heaven. That's what I'm saying is uh, how to be— um, What's the word? I mean, you guys have always been helping me on this. How to be more faith-based, how to be... Well, yeah, I mean, we want we want to be a positive influence in our community, and we our goal and our aim is to try to get as many people uh, walking a better life, you know, and, and, and serving a, a purpose. And, and so we want to help that. We want to be a beacon of light into a community. You know, we look at the world and the world we're in and society and how it dictates certain things. Well... There is uh, something that runs deep through all of us, and and uh, that's the desire to know, you know, how everything started, who our Creator is, and I th- and I believe that's in every one of us. Um, the the want to may not be there, but there is a, a a underlying tone in all of creation that wants to know who its Creator is, and so we as a church want to be. Uh, an avenue, a conduit that people can go find those answers and, and search uh, what truth is. And so uh, as a leadership team, we try to put things in place and uh, to help the community to come and understand what that looks like and, and try to ask those questions and try to learn and grow and just be better people. Um, so anyways. how, how long have you been involved with it? Or is so we moved when I moved here in 2001, I was uh, 10 years old and uh, we just started going to this little church just down the road and just there was a sign that they had out in the street and that sign, you know, it well, had a, I was talking about the, the leadership, like how long <laughs> you've been involved in the leadership. <laughs> I know you've been in the church long. How no, long have I, you been I, alive? I, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I was trying to get to the, What's the your social? question. Well, trying to get to the question that, that uh, just hearing you explain that is what are you, what has been the challenges over the last few years of, of how, I mean, times have changed sure. for sure, and unfortunately, I do believe that the uh, focus on faith-based belief and religion has kind of taken a back seat to a lot of other things. Especially now that we're all kind of being uh, overwhelmed with the social media and stuff like that. So that's sure. what I was there. You know, when I have a question, I'm like, I, I love you, Mike. Yes, you're eight years old. You went into church. You're dressed <laughs> up in a you know beautiful suit but okay i'm trying to get to my question <laughs> okay so i've 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 served in leadership for two years now okay so in those um, two years do you see any difference three um, years actually three sorry years. 2020 uh do you see any difference of three years ago when you first started trying to implement you you guys goals and programs to the way it is right now i mean you, yeah you i feel mean it's more you feel it's harder uh i think it's just it's harder because of the technology we have, you know, sometimes technology makes it challenging, you know, partly because there's such a wide range, wide range or wide variety in a generational gap when you have a church um, and you're leading a bunch of people. 
You've got people who didn't grow up with technology. You're trying to train to, to learn how technology works and, and how to communicate and how to talk and how to be involved with just the communication side of things. We've got these cell phones now that they didn't have back then. You know, there's 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 some some differences. Well, and and what's like a good, for instance, of that? Like pr- when, when there's a prayer request, somebody somebody's struggling, yeah. somebody's in the hospital and we need prayers. We're not necessarily calling everyone on their wall mm. phone anymore. There's yeah. text messages going out and yeah. the, those are systems. There's a portal you're submitting You're having this. to train yeah. old people on how to participate in that communication chain and yeah. all those sorts of things. And so there's because there's such a generational gap, you have people who, who – like we don't have that much trouble learning a new sequence and downloading an app, signing into the app, right. then using the app. But just merely downloading an app from the World Wide Web is a struggle for some people. And we try to navigate that. And that's not the only thing churches do. There's a, a lot right, of other right. things. But that is a challenge. I mean, because you're still not just reaching out to young people. You're reaching out to middle-aged people. You're reaching out to older people because those people also right. are searching and trying to discover who they are or – what all this is for and all that so when it's a constant challenge because it's you know that was an example but it really technology the world we live in ends up touching almost every aspect of of the work the church does because you can use or or your gym does or whatever take whatever organization you can use technology to be better at what you do meaning prayer requests are sent out more efficiently people can log into the website and give even if they were sick right. on Sunday and couldn't make it to church that week. Or, you know, there's a lot of things that can be used in a positive way. At the same time, technology can make things more complicated and technology can distract from the from the point of worship. You know, you see the fog fog machines and light strobes and, you know, whatever. So there's there's balance in how do we use technology and how do we use, you know, the the advancements that that we have to more effectively do the work of the church without taking away from the heart of what we're doing, right? Yeah. So, so you're you're dealing with the challenges of one, getting everybody on board. If there's people there with technology, keeping up with it, maintaining it, and then also the fact that, like I mentioned earlier, still I think that it still takes a backseat to what's going on because you might have an older generation that's willing to accept social media and utilize it for the benefit of the good. But then you might have some newer newer generation that they may not understand um, how to utilize it properly because they just kind of want to go on there. And I mean, there's so much on TikTok and YouTube and Instagram that's, are, that can be toxic, I would mm-hmm. say. Yeah. And trying to get them to understand that, hey, we got to combine it all to one. So that's a pretty that's a pretty tough challenge. I mean, that's just one facet of it. And there's no. there's other things that go on, the maintenance of the building, the upkeep, the curb appeal, the then the ev- ev- evangelistic outreaches, just like the ministries we want to do and the things we want to, how we want to help the people and how we want to get people to our building. How do we want to build those connections? And so we're building connections with schools in the area and we're trying to establish a rapport and just build uh, the name in, in the community. So... I guess that's what uh, goes with kind of what we talked about earlier. What we wanted to kind of focus today was, I mean, are, are we losing or are we losing faith in, in being able to get that done as opposed to what it was done before where you kind of knock on some doors, tell some friends to come over, or now you have so many different outlets that you have to hit and there's so much to have to compete with per se, um, or is it just in general? Because I do believe and this is my opinion. I do believe that uh, America in general has tend to pull away from any faith-based conversation, faith-based promotion, faith-based propaganda because it, for some reason, I, I don't know where it happened, where it, it, it got looked down upon. It, prayer from school was taken away, you know, and simple things like that. It just, it, it still amazes me. Obviously, we're in three different generations and for me to see it to where it is now, it's, I, I don't get it. I, I'm confused. I mean, do you kind of see how, like, what are your feeling? Like, what do you feel about that? Like, I definitely feel there's some more challenges nowadays. I don't think, I think all the, all of the, I think technology is driving a big factor in, in what we're seeing today. Why? Because now we know things instantaneously. We know drama. We know someone can be envious. Someone can be bitter. Someone can be angry. Someone can lust. Someone can desire. Someone. I mean, you have it all 
don't instant. ever don't ever say lust and blink at me again. Don't don't ever say that. Hey, blink hey, blink twice if I'm in trouble. You just blink like fourteen times. <laughs> But, but that's what I'm saying. Like that we, he is, he isn't. He is, he isn't. <laughs> Don't we, help me. Help me. Don't help me. Help me. No. But it's just like it's it's right there, and we can find out information quick. We can have it now, and 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 so I guess the issue has always been there, but now the issue is magnified, and it's more instant, and you can have it right in real time. And then that's a, that's just a challenge, you know. And some people didn't grow up with that, and some people are growing up in it. And we have all these social media platforms and all these things, and it's just like. We've got to be able. How do you? How does the older generation teach a younger generation anything about the current things going on when they don't have any history of learning how to navigate through that? Well, and here, here's where I see the biggest challenge when it comes to uh, modern technology and social media and all those sorts of things you're saying, and where it may play into the lack of religious practice and, and lack of religious faith is now everybody human beings have always had a God complex. We've always wanted to be like God all the way back in the garden. That's the reason the fruit was consumed is because we wanted to be like God. We wanted to have that kind of understanding. Well, now we have all of human knowledge basically at our fingertips at all times. Now Elon Musk is putting chips in people's brains so that they can access it without even picking up their phones. And we're just always chasing human knowledge. And then in turn, you know, just as much as the church can do great things using social media by putting out positive messages and encouraging people to, to turn to Christ, to, to, to love their neighbor and all of those sort of foundational principles, as much as that can happen, you also can have people getting on social media constantly arguing about religion. And you can have even good-hearted people who are just ignorant spreading false information uh, about the Bible, and then you can have, and by ignorant, I don't mean anything negative, other than they they're just they they misunderstand and they don't understand what they're saying. And then on the flip side, you've got people mocking religion, and social media clicks and algorithms are made for controversy. And the more people argue, the more traffic is driven, and that sort of kind of toxic uh, system only moves you toward more division, which I think turns people away from religion altogether. And so anything that I put on social media related to my faith or Christianity or even just encouraging people to do good in their communities or whatever, I try to make as positive as possible. And I'm not saying I've always been perfect at it, but if I'm going to get on there and talk about Bible, I want to be encouraging people to make good decisions in their life and encouraging people to love their neighbor and encouraging people to to take care of their families and all of those sorts of things because I can get on there and argue with people all day long but that's not going to win souls and that's not going to convince people that I'm right you know how many people have been con converted to Christianity based on an internet conversation I'm sure it's very very low uh, but I think there are a lot of people who can be inspired to to better their lives, inspired to, to love people and inspired to, to all of those sorts of things based on a positive message. It won't get as many clicks. It just won't. But you can make a greater impact. And, and that, that's what kind of uh, upsets me as kind of the, the old schooler. I feel that it, there's a little hesitation to actually post anything, uh, speaking your faith and guy related, but people can throw pronouns around and then be okay with it I, and that's I, and I I can see that I mean obviously I have to be on social media before, for the gym but if honestly if I didn't own a gym I probably wouldn't have any social media just because I I see I do see the benefit to it but I also see the destruction of the the minds and and you're more accepted to uh, post what's going on or w what's you know in you know in right now he she her him and the them them like but if you put god fearing man ugh, you're evil it's well like, and that's the thing is even if you go out to put out a positive message there will be you're going to cause controversy if you are standing up for any sort of faith or or whatever uh but at the end of the day if you get on to say something positive and then people get in your comment sections to bicker and to fight and whatever that is a reflection on them not on you and that's where I've kind of had to accept that is I am going to try to to put out and I say positive not not everything in life is positive there's some 
scripture that is warnings. It's a very negative message, if you want to call it that, because there are real seri- there's times to be serious in life and take sin seriously and take uh, your, your past mistakes seriously and move forward. But at the end of the day, you're moving towards a positive goal, which is not just a better life, but a better faith and a better eternal future and, and those sorts of things. And so if you're trying to put out that message and then people want to argue in your comments, then they're just going to argue in your comments. Um, but that, again, is where technology can be used as, as a really good tool and as a very negative tool. And I'm sure as a leadership team, and I'm not involved in all of this, but we've got – it just happens. You've got members doing really positive things. You've got members getting online saying crazy stuff, and you're trying to help guide people and go, hey, let's let's – push people toward Christ, not towards divisive opinions and not toward, you know, because it's very easy to fall into all of that. So I'm sure that's a lot of what you're attributing to. Do you wish you can just do kind of like the men in black, like, and just like make them all think (laughs) one certain way, one certain day? (laughs) Honestly, no. I mean, it would have been very easy for God to create it that way too, right? But what did he give you? Aliens. Free will. (laughs) (laughs) Same thing. No. (laughs) But he gave you free will to make the choice to do what you want to do, but uh, what he wants. I think you were referencing the movie, my bad. No. no. <laughs> That's what happened. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, but he gave us free will, and we have the free will choice to to serve or to not serve, and and that's what we want. We we're, the church is not for perfect people. The church no, is for people course. who are imperfect, wanting to to have a relationship with the Creator. That's what the church is for. And so I don't want to I don't want to sit here and paint the picture that we're we're full of people who have it put together and have it all no we're a bunch of broken people mended together and and that's what we are we hold each other accountable we hold each other to a standard and and that's what we do I mean and we just want to be good people we want to be good people for the person who created us and and that's the God Almighty so so how, how do we get that? I mean, how do we bring that back? I, I do believe that years ago that, I mean, it, it was it was more prevalent. I mean, how do, how do we bring it back? I mean, you guys are the young whippersnappers, and, you know, you I, guys I, I think are, part of it's changing the cycle. I think that's part of it. I mean, it, we, we've got to become a culture or, or a country that goes back to the beginning. And you got to have, you got to want to, you got to want that. But we are a people who want it for ourselves, and not for everybody else. It's not loving your neighbor as you would, uh, you know, or taking care of what everybody else's things or taking care of their problems. It's, everyone's so self-centered and worried about themselves. And we stopped focusing on everybody else. We started focusing on our, us. That's the problem. That's the problem from the beginning. We worried about ourselves. And if we just took a little moment to think about somebody else, the world would be a better place. You know, when you mentioned that about the neighbor, I think that's that's kind of funny because I remember growing up, um, we would go to all these houses and play, and houses down from where we lived, and it would be nighttime. We might have dinner there. We might not. We might have some snacks, but, you know, we knew when to come home. And our neighbors, they, they just kind of took care of us, regardless of what situation there they were in. And then, like nowadays, you if you have a kid that lives five houses down. You're like, what are you doing on my driveway? Like, I, <laughs> I see that, and I've had to to take it upon myself to try to understand when you know some of the neighborhood kids come by and they want to play and they want to, you know, if I have the garage door up and they, hey, can I borrow your basketball? Or can I borrow your football? I'm like, no. But, but what? But what <laughs> changed? Was like, what changed? I, that's what I, I don't know. And the only thing I could point to, I mean. There were still people who made mistakes when you were, uh, you know, growing up, right? And those mistakes are still happening today. What has changed? Knowing those mistakes right now, it's instantaneous information in, right now. I mean, we get it so quick. So we, we start to make reservations or start putting these defense mechanisms up because we know there are bad people out there. And we just are like, we're towing a line like, yeah. okay, I don't know that I want to send my child down there. I don't really know that person. Back in the day, kids yeah, would be yeah, running man. the streets. Yeah. You know, why? So I, the thing that has changed is technology. And you've got people now, you know, whether they're actors or actresses or sports people or whatever, who at times they claim certain beliefs or religious beliefs or some people – don't or I just I mean it's, it's, we got a wide range of things and it's all this information being processed through a, a smart device and and 
I think that's part of it. I think that's a big part of it. That's why it's changing. So, well, and on top of that, again, based on the self-centered culture that we have, what does social media do? Yeah. It gives every single person the feeling that everybody cares about what they're saying. <laughs> I know that sounds yeah. harsh, um, but I mean, there, you can get a high follower count and think you're all that and all of these people watch your videos and you got a lot of views on that one and you get more likes than the person next to you or this person feels inferior because they they don't have the following their friend does or they don't look the same way so they don't get the same amount of likes and it creates this whole culture and I really especially fear for the young people in my life that I see coming up because I guess I didn't really mess with social media until high school plus but I mean there's people in elementary school going through self-conscious because they oh, yeah. can't get the validation. engagement and the, <laughs> the validation sure. that their friends get and whatever and all that's doing is perpetuating a self-focused life and whether you have a lot of followers or no followers either way that can cause problems I mean you start to feel like you start to get that God complex and feel like anybody really cares what's going on in your life beyond just social media or you try to paint a picture of your life on social media that's not realistic and then on the flip side you start to think that you're less than because your picture on social media isn't someone else's picture on social media and social media is just not real life and when you get down to ground level and you start to talk to people and put the phones away and you have dinner actually looking people in the eye you realize everybody's going through the same stuff I mean at different levels Theo Vaughn yeah. says everybody's got their Vietnam you know and it's a funny way of saying it but I mean to a small extent everybody's got stuff going on in their life and when you start to connect with people at that level you can start to learn from how how people have remained resilient and how people move through that stuff and how you can band together as a community and we talked about certain times in our country's history where tragedy hits and all of a sudden you see that start to happen again people pulling together whatever mm -hmm. But we just live so comfortable and all in our own little worlds with our own little smartphone thinking that because we have a certain follower count or whatever that that we're somehow elevated above other people or vice versa. When in reality, there's just real people walking around us every day. Yeah, I'd be <clears throat> I'd be curious to to see the and you're probably way better at this than I am, obviously, um, is the analytics between somebody posting a prayer or showing them at a church as opposed to them on a beach somewhere in a in a bathing suit like i'm gonna take a, a guess and say this it's probably going to be more toward a hey, oh out on the beach you know showing but that's well, what i think that's why it upsets me is that I'm, I'm like man we're forgetting where where we started and, and well, it's and like you're, it's, you're it's hitting an important disappointing. you're hitting an important point because i was talking to a, a guy who's He's working with a lot of churches on their social media, and he's really trying to help them to get more traffic and make a better impact using their posts and, and all that sort of stuff. And uh, he's he's showing me what he's doing, and I'm giving him advice on how you can caption it to keep people engaged on the post for longer and get a higher retention rate, and therefore it will get pushed to more people. And we're going through all that sort of stuff, but we're finagling a system that wasn't built for prayer. Right. The system is built to keep you engaged as long as possible on the most addictive content as possible. And that's unfortunately why you, I, I know you laughed at the lust word earlier or whatever, but we have a whole culture. <laughs> I don't like that word. We, we have a whole culture of Instagram models and young men growing up watching that and getting addicted to these social media yep. platforms because of the very visually stimulating things that mm -hmm. we see all the time. And again, damaging real human interaction damaging okay. relationship with future wife damaging relationship with yeah. because we're constantly looking at a screen and we're looking at things that just are not real and you think about how these algorithms are built they want your eyes on it as long as possible that is what keeps people on the platform and makes them more money I'm not saying that's even inherently evil but what does that encourage it encourages showing the most addictive content that you can to push the community guidelines as far as you can to keep people looking at you as far as possible. And that doesn't happen from a prayer post. People read the prayer post and they move on. Right. And so we're now playing a skewed game trying to put a positive message out 
on a platform that has become unfortunately inherently negative a lot of the time. And we're, we're trying to type out a caption to keep people on the post as long as possible because that little image with, with the two Bible verses isn't enough. Yeah. And that's just a sad position to be in, but that's the game we have to play now. That, and, and see, that's what gets, it drives me crazy because uh, I guess I always said that I never wanted to act my age or show my age, but then when this starts happening, I start thinking back to, in my, t- you know, you always hear in my days or my times, but man, before I wanted to watch uh, wrestling on Saturday or Sunday, I, I had to sit there. If I was up early enough, I had to watch 30 minutes of the on channel eight or channel 14, the, the prayer channel, the, the evangelist and, and how they spoke on respecting your mother, respecting your family, you know, being a kind friend. Like I remember that and I just wanted to get to watch my, you know, Saturday and Sunday morning wrestling, but you know, we only had five channels and three of them were, they were a prayer channel, but it, I think that's what the social media was for me back then. Cause it wasn't on the phone, but it was accepted. I mean, it, it taught me a lot. And you had so less it, options and the less options. Now, like you said, you go through it and it's just, we, we just, it's not promoted enough. It's just not out there enough. And then they're there. I do. I, I feel like they're taking it away from the opportunity to really promote it to where even I remember in school, we used to have activities with our local churches. We just, it's hard to do it. I mean, you, you mentioned it earlier about partnering with the schools. They're probably like, well, we don't want to. Actually, actually we're working with the school now that has welcomed. They said, we want to provide awesome. a connection to a church. And, and again, you gotta, you have to navigate that carefully because you have to respect everybody, yeah. you know, but at the same time, what we want to do is we want to help kids. We want to help kids that may not have a, a, a childhood that, that's uh, going to help groom this child to be successful. And it's not because they're mother and father. They may be in foster care. They may be in this or that. I mean, so the child is having to, to navigate life without those, those lead examples. And we want to be a, a church that, that helps that young child and, and, and understand what life's about and, and give them the tools, whether it be a few meals or whether it be school supplies or whether it be just a, hey man, we're here to support you with what you need and, and try to engage with this young man or this young girl or and, and just try to help them out so that when they're making decisions later in life, they're acting differently, they're speaking differently, they're, they've got a, a vision about them. And so that's what we want. We wanna change the generations that are coming behind us. We wanna change the cycle. And that's what I think we have to do. We have to break the cycle that we're in and we start making the next generation better than the generation we're in. That's what I want for my daughters. I want my daughters to be better human beings than their parents. Well, and, then, that, and I want to I want to keep perpetual, you know, that perpetual motion going. I want them to train their kids to be better than them and then the families that they raise and the influence that they have. If we all do this, I mean, it's like the song, the love can cure the world, but we, it does it by people thinking differently not thinking about themselves. Well, and that, that's what I was visiting with a guy about today. He was asking me about our church and some of the stuff we were involved in. And what I was trying to explain to him is like, at the end of the day, our goal is to get more people to heaven. But in that process, there's a lot of stuff that we're commanded to do. And then some opportunities that come to us day by day that we have to try to navigate. And at the end of the day, try to help people. Um, we're t- told that pure religion and undefiled before God is this, to visit the fatherless and the widows in their affliction. You're talking about people who've, who've lost a provider, lost a caregiver, lost their, their spouse. And these, there's hurting people everywhere. And that's part of our mission is to reach out and to love on these people and to give them a community and a family. Jesus says, I think it's in Matthew 13, and I, somebody can fact check me if you want, but he, and I'm paraphrasing, but he says... If you cause one of these little children to sin, basically, if you in any way hurt this child, then it would be better that a stone was wrapped around your neck and you were drowned in the bottom of the ocean. And that's just a crazy wild way of saying that children are precious and they should be loved and they should be cared for and there should be opportunities given to them because... If you neglect that, just like we're told pure religion and undefiled before God is this, caring for those sorts of people, if you neglect that, what does that say about you? If you're neglecting the needs of your neighbor, it all comes back to those two greatest commandments that we're given, which is to love God and to love our neighbor. 
And that's the mission of the church. And that's even if you disagree with me fundamentally on religion, I hope we can come together and at least say that that's a good message. Because even if you believe in a different God than I do, and maybe I can get you to come around, you know, but regardless, if we can agree that those are good fundamental principles to live by, then we will see the world change so fast. That's on point. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I mean, there's nothing you can say about that. That's, I mean, that's amazing. That was, I mean, that's even eye opening for me. I mean, I, it's always good for everyone to kind of uh, hear that and be reassured. I mean, because I mean, I'm pretty sure everybody loses faith at times when yeah, we, things we, happen, and we just, both have. So, you know, just to be reassured and just to reassure those that listen and and are watching, it's well. And at the end just, of the day, Alex, you know why Michael has that passion, wants to to lead people towards Christ and love on people. Same with James, same with me, hopefully with you, is because people did that for you. Like right, at one point that. in my life, oh, I sure. felt lost and people were willing to wake up at five in the morning and go to the gym with me because that's what I wanted to do. Oh, yeah, they wanted sure. to spend time and invest into me. And there were people who woke up at four in the morning to go meet me for breakfast because I knew I needed somebody to talk to. And there's people who made all those sacrifices while working full time jobs, while having Bible studies with other people, while all they have lives and families and all but they made time for me for sure. and i want to be able to do that for the next guy I, I think that that should be for everyone that's even listening i mean if you have that opportunity to help someone i mean i'm pretty sure that not everyone social group or social circle is doing perfect and if they are you know much props to them but just uh, volunteering your time, volunteering your your listening ear, or just no, I agree with that. But it, it all starts what we just mentioned about it's just having faith and belief and whatever uh, good is out there, it is, and we just have to believe and continue to trust. Where you know, like I mean, I've learned so much just in the last you know few months we've been here, and I've always had that. Uh, uh, I've always had faith. I mean, I learned today that there is a difference between faith and belief. So um, I took it upon myself to kind of educate myself more and understand that I want to be more faith-based in what I feel and what I think uh, from everything. So, I mean, like I said, I mean, you guys have helped a lot with that. So, I mean, you just got to, if we can just continue that to everyone and just, even if it's just one person, they can hope that I think that we can resort back to I feel back in the days where I really do feel that everybody genuinely cared about themselves before everybody else. I, and nowadays, I I think it's just selfishness. And yeah. I, I think we can change it, though. I, I mean, I still have hope. We're still in the greatest country ever. God bless America. <laughs> well, and it's like you said, walking based on faith means that there will be action in your life. I mean, mm -hmm. J James says that faith without works is dead. You know, w w people who walk around proclaiming that they're a faith-based person but refuse to love their neighbor? Are they really a faith-based person? Faith in what? Yourself? Faith <laughs> in your own righteousness? Faith in your own, you know, whatever? That's not what, that's not the gospel. That's not, that's not what Jesus teaches. And at the end of the day, it comes back to those two great commandments. And everything else, the way you live your life, all the other ins and outs and challenging things that we deal with in life, there's a lot of guidance in scripture, yeah. but it all comes back to those things. Can I, I share a quick story? <laughs> so love I don't like thy where neighbor. This is going so, already. <laughs> so love thy neighbor, right? So I, I did lose faith for a few years, and everywhere I lived, uh, I just completely was. Don't bother me. I don't want to know who my neighbor is. I don't care if they need help. If they're starving. If they're flooded. I don't care. Like I just hit a, a, a point in my life where I was like that. Uh, now that uh, I see things a lot differently few weeks ago my neighbor comes over one rings the doorbell I look at that I'm like it's our neighbor old Alex would have been like shh everybody would quiet turn the TV <laughs> down well I was like no I, I literally thought I was like what would uh Jonathan James and Michael do they would open the door and be like if he's okay that's all because this was Jays because <laughs> <laughs> this was like at nine o'clock at night and I was like, "What? Is, what is he doing?" I, I can assure, I would have just been like, "No, everybody, shh, be quiet." So, uh, even my wife was like, "What do you want to answer it?" And I literally thought of, I was like, "They would probably answer it." So, I opened the door, and he's like, "Hey," I was like, "Hey, what's up, man?" 
let me show you this. So he shows me his phone and he's showing me this video of all these bats. And I was like, oh, that's disgusting. And then I was like, where is that? And he goes, in your backyard. And I was like, about to shut the door on him and be like, you better run. <laughs> but I said, I said, man, I said, come, I said, come inside, come inside. So he he steps in, I close the door, and I think this was the, one of the first times I've ever allowed a neighbor in my house. And I'm talking about I've been a homeowner for almost, I mean, 20 years. But all I kept on thinking about was like, man, he I think he genuinely means good. Like I don't I don't know him personally, but he has to mean but he was concerned that him and his daughter and son were in the back and they're young and they saw bats coming out and he was scared for them. But he also was helping me to say, Man, you got bats coming out of your corner. So the love thy neighbor took it into the fact that love James because then <laughs> James helped me out and but I, I see it as a full circle because it made me think the next day, like if he, if I would have just ignored him, he don't have my number or anything. He probably wouldn't have seen me because he travels a lot. I would have not known that there was bats. I would have not known that his kids are in, in danger. And then the thought that of what you guys have actually taught me was like, hey, man, this is a man in need. Like, he's coming to my house at 9 o'clock at night. And he, he actually looked concerned because <laughs> I was like, yo, what's going on? And I was like, where is it at? My baker, come inside. Let's hide. <laughs> It's just us now. Your family's gone. <laughs> and not all heroes wear capes because James <laughs> Minson came and, and saved you from the bats. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he came back uh, on Saturday and we, we, we spoke and we talked and we, we actually have a lot in common as, a, as, a, as we approach just, you know, with, with family and, you know, as, as the men of the household. He had to do what he had to do. He had to come over to a stranger's house at 9 o'clock at night to be like, yo, man, you got bats, <laughs> and I got kids. So his first instinct was, I'm going to be a father. I'm going to protect my family, which I respected that. And then he was able to communicate with me in a very diplomatic way, like, man, you might want to take care of this. So, you know, we've been communicating back and forth. So I'm like, man, I got me a neighbor now. I'm, like, so excited. I know, like, and now I think that's just a, an awesome story because now you have a connection with this guy where you, you guys can help each other out. Yeah. And that's kind of the influence that – the church is. We want to build a connection with the community that we're in, right? Why? So the neighbor can knock on our door and we can stand in the gap for a neighbor. That's what we want yes, to do to I help agree. them get to a better place. But that event would have never happened without bats. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And that's just crazy to me. It's like now you can love on your neighbor and be like, hey, man, let's go. Let's grill next Saturday. Yeah, I, I let's totally hang agree. out. Let's let's get our families together. And he can come over to your house and you can go over to his house. Those are those connections that, man, if people just did that, the world would be a better place. Well, but what are we doing? We're doing this. Yeah. That's what we're doing. We're not talking to each other. We're not yeah. hanging out. It's just we're afraid to get out and knock on our neighbor's door and just see what's going on in their life. You and know? just to clarify, because I know what you mean, but for those who don't, when he says that's the role of the church is to build those connections, we don't mean the the building that we all come to to worship or some entity somewhere that we all subscribe to but we mean the church is the body of christ that's us that's right. the people yeah. who have faith in jesus christ who are going out and doing the good work every day and uh and and i think that's one of the problems is we've detached ourselves we a lot of our culture sees the church as a place to go to on sunday to try to get your fix to try to to feel better for a day and then spend six days out alone and that's not what the church is it's a community of people and people should know that they can roll up to the doors when people are there or they can roll up to my house and come and ask for help and we're going to have people who can wrap our arms around you and, and we're going to help you through you know we're not just going to go sit, send you to a shelter or send you to a food bank or whatever, but we'll go with you. Like, let's walk through this situation and we want to see you on the other end of whatever problem you're having. And again, that's because somebody did that for us at one point in our life. It might not have all been the same thing. It might not have all been the same addiction or substance or whatever people deal with, but we've all been there to where we needed people and somebody reached out. And at the end of the day, that's what the church is, is a group of people who, who want to love you. Yeah, uh, that was all. Even as something as negative as I thought with the the bats, I it was placed at the right time, and you know, and I and I needed that. It was it was it was a good feeling. It was a good feeling. I mean, of course, it, it, having bats is never a, a good thing, but um, 
I think the, at that time and how it happened, I was like, man, because I was always curious because I would always see him go and I would hear him in the backyard with his kids and it just, but I never had it in myself to go out there and, and, and speak. So. Isn't that so wild though? Like how many times in your life have you actually seen bats? <laughs> <laughs> we had enough of them. <laughs> I saw um, one bat one time and it was hanging on the outside of my office at this company I was working at in broad daylight, just just chilling, sleeping on the wall. And <laughs> Me and my boss were walking by. He went, is that is that what I think it is? I turned. I was like, bro, that's a bat. Like, <laughs> in broad daylight. I thought they hid. Like, I thought they went somewhere dark. It's, it's right here in the sun just chilling. That's the one time in my life I've seen a bat. Is that next to the wall where you had that giant map? <laughs> the outside oh. of that wall. <laughs> Where's Montana? That's, I'm going to Montana. There it is. I can't, I can't say the only thing that... Uh, Mr. James, who's behind the camera, has been helping us. He's a brave soul. Them bats were boom, popping him on the head, and then he goes, let's see him, how many I can kill. And he's swiping a rag at it. And I'm like, dude, no. And I, I literally like ran inside, and I popped my head out there. I was like, stop. He goes, hold on, let's see if we can catch one. Bah! And he was just swiping them. But that also gave me the appreciation, like, man, you have to have good people around you. Surround yourself with good people because, I mean, that, that was a lot. There was a lot of them. And they were just bop, bop, popping did, them on the did, head. He didn't have a helper? Uh, Daryl just sat there. Daryl was like the Statue of Liberty, just having the bats land on his hand. And he's just... <laughs> I hear I hear they do good at, you know during the holiday season for Christmas lights. I don't know about that. You can call them for bats. I'm not calling them back for, I'm going to refer him to my neighbor for Christmas lights. He puts hey, Christmas lights on. There you go. Man, he has he, he's a pilot. He has a good steady job. He actually cool. makes money. I'll call him. Let's see if we can do the podcast on a plane one time. <laughs> yeah. Well, bro, that would oh, be that so would cool. Probably, Wouldn't yeah, that be cool? Fly, so, yeah. I said we need to take I've been saying we need to take our our show on the road. We ain't having enough space for that in the economy. Alex is going to have to pay for some first class. Yeah, first Oh, yeah. The Spirit Spirit has awesome first class. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to lie. People hate Spirit. I love Spirit. I, 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 My I, mom loves Spirit. I man. love Spirit. Their people are always the best. They're always joking around. <laughs> it's so fun, bro. So uh, one of the reasons everybody hates Spirit is because they nickel and dime you for everything. So they'll give you cheap tickets, and then yeah. they charge you for your carry-on. They charge the you for you and everything. Well, with a military ID, they can't charge you for any of that. So I get the cheap tickets, and then all my luggage is free. And oh, all, wow. All, all that. So I may pay five bucks. you got bucks. 45 suitcases. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I may pay, you know, five bucks for a snack on the plane just because it's not included or whatever, but I get the cheap tickets. And on top of that, they are the coolest employees. I'm I telling you, I've you. never had a bad spirit experience. No, I don't know I, what everybody's I, I, talking about. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. So we are not sponsored, by the way. Yeah, not at all. By but that. if you guys want to sponsor us, <laughs> I've had good experiences. And Michael can lie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean I've I've flown Spirit across country and it's like 100 bucks, you know, and it's like, oh yeah, I'll do that. But you know, if you're going on long distance, like flying to Africa or Germany, Spirit's not the way to go. I don't think they I don't even think go they international. Go there. Well, I was like, no, well, they do. Like, they go to South America or, oh, wow. or good for them. That is not Mexico. where Nigeria is. Well, <laughs> I know. Do, you, do you need a map? Do you need a map like Michael? <laughs> I'm not going to Nigeria. No, that I've heard Canada. everybody say it's so cramped and whatever. I haven't even had that experience. No. They've been I mean, all airlines are cramped. There's a lot there's a bunch of people suing airlines right now because they can't fit in the seats. You know, just Yeah, that'll be next ov- that's, overweight that, that'll individuals. be the next topics. Yeah, that cause that upsets me too, because I had to move my seat because of an instant like that. Because of spillage. Yeah. I don't think that was fair. You got to get out of your high chair and like. <laughs> I was totally comfortable in my. Uh, chair I mean, there's kind of two sides to that. Where w- on one hand, I'm like, okay, well, you're a big person, so you're sitting in a small seat. Buy a bigger seat, get two seats, you know, whatever. The personal responsibility, right? On the flip side, I'm like, do you guys know not know what country you're in? You're in America. You can't make bigger seats, like. Well, they put the, the most amount of seats. Have you seen, They're trying to make as much have money you seen as those, possible. Have you seen those planes where they... Uh, the double-decker one. Yeah, where the yeah. people are like sitting on top of it. Yeah. That is what? wild. Let me see if I can pull it's it a, up. It's a new uh, way of flying how they're supposed to be like 
even cheaper than economy flights. So you, you know how like a roller coaster, you can go, you have one person up here and their feet yeah. are dangling and another person. And they're like over your face. <laughs> yeah. That's how the flight is. They, they started making the flights to be able to basically fit. I mean, if there's a roll of four, you can, you can fit eight in this one little section. You know, tickets are like 10 bucks, but you're going to have like heels hitting you while you're flying. <laughs> I don't know about all that. <laughs> I was. They uh, were pretty close. I was in chicago a couple years back and I, I went to this museum they had oh my goodness yeah no I'll pass. that's wild Let's so go. they they let you like prop up the feet i guess and turn it into some sort of little and futon. that's a nice one because I, i've seen some ones that are are you're like just buckled in those are some nice ones. that's crazy so okay they're, they're anyway so in chicago i was at this museum and they let you sit in these uh like it was a uh, model of some of the earliest commercial uh planes and the seats were big and they were cushioned and nice and it was like a real like replica or whatever and i'm sitting in it like bro what happened to airlines <laughs> i mean it just it's a cash cow so they're just trying to get as many seats in there as possible i guess but i don't know but like when we flew uh international those first class seats look awesome i mean those people are laying down they can roll over they get a nice pillow and blanket and i'm over there like fighting this one lady for the armrest yeah you know? <laughs> <laughs> like, just, choose your battle so i'm leaning against the the because i've got a window seat and so since i'm tall you know the 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 cab starts curving just where oh, my yeah. head is so i'm i'm like this <laughs> you know so oh man the crick in your neck after you fall asleep <sighs> you get up you, oh yeah. Ah. yeah, and then you try to stretch your back, but you can only lean forward like this much, <laughs> and then you're hitting the seat in front of you, and then what? you're like, okay, and this way. One one day we're all gonna use uh, Jonathan's uh, dis military discount to go fly somewhere first class. We'll, we'll do that. Does it but apply to all of us? No way. No. <laughs> yeah, you. If you book the flights, but. <laughs> <laughs> if you book it, we just I lost mean, our spirit. In if you guys <laughs> put all of your stuff into two big bags of luggage, then I can get all our luggage oh, for that's free. That's for Alex sure. is like, I'll get in one. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> wait, us to travel? I was like, if we can go somewhere, <laughs> done deal. Yeah. Easy peasy. See, that sounds like a good idea, but you haven't seen those guys loading the luggage, bro. Oh, yeah. Yeet. That's why I just close the window when, I, when I'm like, oh, there's our back. Oh, just Close the window. They're like, oh, this one feels frail. Yeah. I mean, I ain't going to lie. If I was doing that, I would probably try to see how far I could throw them too. So, I mean, I, I used to work at UPS and I did that. So, I traveled to Ohio uh, to meet up with Mick Blankenship. Uh, awesome guy, but I went and recorded in his studio for a while and whatever. I brought my guitar and tagged it and checked it. And I was like, oh, I'm so nervous for this. Well, once I got there, I was waiting for for the guitar, and I, I I guess stood at the wrong like whatever they call it that conveyor ba belt baggage thing claim. for the yeah baggage, baggage claim. I I, <laughs> I was at the wrong one, and I just hear this Rip. big thud behind me. I turn around, and my guitar just got yeeted out of this baggage claim. I picked it up. It's all the it was in a case, obviously, but the corners all dented. I was like, goodness. They should have learned that. It's not gentle. Well, on that note.